Hey, welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. We're glad you're tuning into this episode. Uh, we are a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we really appreciate you listening, watching on YouTube. We really encourage you to subscribe to whatever platform you're using. If you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, or if you're on Apple or however you listen to a podcast, be sure and subscribe. We greatly appreciate it. Also, make comments if you like it and share it if you like it. We really need people to make comments and share the episodes that you like. And then also, if you're not already a supporter, we really would encourage you to go to spiritualityadventures.com and you can pick a tier and we have bonus content for every type of giver. These are this is a nonprofit, so they're tax deductible donations, but we do provide bonus content for those who uh, are our supporters. So be a part of the team, help support Spirituality Adventures, and we're so glad you're tuning in. To- All right, welcome everybody. Great to have you join us on Spirituality Adventures. Thanks for uh, tuning in to this episode. Today we've got Jose Martinez. Jose Martinez. And Jose and I met. Maybe not even a year ago, I don't think. Yeah, that's relatively recent. Right. Yeah, less than a year old. And we mm-hmm. met through our uh, through our connection. You know, when I became a disciple of Christ pastor at Living Water Christian Church, which was about eight months ago, um, our paths crossed. Actually, you came and visited the church, I think, yeah, and then we yeah. ended up having coffee. <laughs> right. yeah. I just like, hey, I'm going to go to Living Water today, and then here you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but uh, yeah, and then we've we've connected several times, saw each other at the General Assembly, which is the national uh, conference for the Disciples of Christ that was in Louisville back in July. Um, you know, had had the opportunity to connect over a number of things, so. Thank you, Jose, for being here. Well, thank you for having me. So Jose has done many things. We're going to we're going to just kind of get his life story, his origin story, what he does in ministry and and work. But uh, his official title right now with the uh, he's on the national leadership team for the Disciples of Christ denomination. And he is minister of new church strategies. So that is their. That, that's basically starting new churches, right? Right. New congregations. That's right. In America. Yeah. Uh, and in Canada too. So um, okay. I will be heading out to Canada to visit the Canadian region, uh, as we call it. Um, uh, the national pastor there uh, invited me to come and, and visit some of the congregations and think about ways of how we can start new congregations there in Canada. Excellent. Excellent. So, yeah, I did. I did a doctor of ministry at Fuller Theological Seminary, and worked with uh, Peter Wagner and uh, a, a, several other professors there. And but wrote my dissertation on church planting. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah. So and then obviously started my own church, and then out of that church started many churches, both in America, Europe, and Africa and South America. Mm-hmm. So. Um, so we'll have a lot to talk about. <laughs> but first, let's uh, let's talk about your background. Where'd you grow up? Give us a little bit of your family history and maybe your family faith tradition and that kind of thing. Uh, okay. Yeah. So as you can tell, I'm Latino, uh, Jose Martinez. So uh, <clears throat> my grandfather was actually the person that immigrated to the United States and uh, married my grandmother who... Her father was the one that immigrated. Where did he? To, where did he immigrate from? Uh, Jalisco, uh, state of Met, and it's a state in Mexico, Jalisco. Okay. And um, <clears throat> my my great great grandfather um, immigrated from Guanajuato, Mexico. So we're Mexican, and my grandmother <clears throat> was born in the United States. And my family, uh, my mom's side of the family, is from the southern part of California in Santa Ana, California. So that's where I kind of like tell people that's where I'm from, you know, Santa Ana, California. I still have all my cousins out there. I still go visit, you know, quite often to go visit family and, and plus go to Disneyland because <laughs> Disneyland is a lot of fun and Knott's Berry Farm, of course. And then um, my mom, uh, she joined the military, uh, the Air Force in particular. And um, 
met my biological father who I never met. Um, he, he got out of the picture of what I was relatively young before I even was born, you know, young love, you know, that sort of thing, come and go, that sort of thing. And he was also in the military. Um, but as time was going on, I grew, stayed with my, my grandparents for a while because my mom went to Korea, was stationed in Korea, came back, and then she got me, and then she was stationed out over in Turkey. So a lot of my elementary school years, uh, I, I was in Europe, in Turkey, and my mom traveled around a lot. I went with her and got to see a lot of the part of the world before the age of eight. <laughs> so, you know, I was speaking Turkish and um, seeing all these awesome sites in, in Turkey because that was uh, historically Ephesus. So <laughs> we would go on these weird trips, you know, to see these churches and caves, to see these different sites that were like amphitheaters where um, the Apostle Paul would speak, you know, that sort of thing. And um, my mom, uh, was culturally Catholic. So all my family was culturally Catholic. So I was growing up more of the Catholic tradition on Christmas and Easter. And I was baptized in, in the Catholic church as an infant. And um, my mom met my stepdad when we came back to the United States and she was stationed at Edward Air Force Base, California. And my, my stepdad was a Southern Baptist uh, person. He, uh, he has his brothers, all his brothers are Southern Baptist preachers, uncles that are Southern Baptist preachers. I mean, so he was steeped in the Southern Baptist tradition. And so therefore we were all grafted in, <laughs> into the Southern Baptist tradition. And this was I was about, eight or nine. Well, so 10, 10, uh, 10 years old. Um, that's when my mom okay. met my, my stepdad. And, and you guys were living in California, in California. Okay. Uh-huh. Huh. And he was part of this really cool project back in the day. It was really sweet or squirrel stuff. Uh, he was part of the B2 bomber project. <laughs> and so he would go off on these little secret missions sort of thing to help, you know, construct the program. And uh, he got then to be stationed at Whiteman Air Force Base when I was about uh, 11 years old. And my mom then got transferred also to Whiteman Air Force Base. And so we moved to Missouri and so, like, I'm at 11, 12 years old at this time, and um, they didn't want to live on base, so they bought a house in a small town called Sedalia, Missouri, where the Missouri State Fair is at, you know. So I had a really interesting time with that because in Sedalia, there there wasn't a lot of um, minority folks living in Sedalia, in particular, Latin Latino, Latina uh, people. So I was, like, one of the first Latino kids in the class that I was in. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. So, uh, until I, yeah, so I, I was stereotyped <laughs> a lot. And then when, uh, Tyson foods came into town, then all of a sudden uh, the immigrant population exploded back in the mid nineties. And so, uh, then people started to see the difference between the difference between Mexican American versus, you know, the first generation, uh, Latino people. So mm. it, really interesting time in my life in that, and then I joined the, uh, so through the mid nineties, you know, going through high school, uh, and then, you know, we were going through these different conflicts like Bosnia. And so I had a real calling to, uh, military. And when I was 17, a junior in high school, I signed up to be part of the army. Uh, army had a, a special pro program called the split option program where you go your summer of your junior year. So basic training, you come back, you finish your senior year, and then you're off again doing army stuff after that senior year. So that's what I did. I joined wow. the army. Yeah. And it was really good because, you know, you get college money and all this other stuff. But uh, during that time, it was 97, 98. Um, Bosnia was kind of in the mix of all that. So I was trying to get to serve my country sort of thing on that aspect. So uh and, you know, as time goes on, I didn't go to Bosnia. I was still in high school, still finishing up my AIT, all that other stuff. And then uh, ni the 90s end. And, of course, we get into the 2000s. And then that's when everything starts hitting the fan because of 9-11. So, right. you know, I get called up for the 9-11 <clears throat> and do the airport duty that um, at that time I was in the Na Army National Guard going to college. I was in the Army National Guard. I get called up and do what they had was Operation Noble Eagle, where all the 
air guard, uh, national guardsmen were guarding the airports. And that's what I did during that time. Which airports? Uh, so I went, I went to KCI. So we, okay. we had, we had a, a whole, uh, basically it would have been a, a, a platoon sized, uh, contingent there at KCI. They were at St. Louis international here in Missouri. Mm-hmm. There's some other airports like Springfield and Joplin that they sent some guard members to, but all over the nation, if people remember that the army national guard was guarding these airports, like mm. right after nine 11. So, um, so that was part of that. And then I came back yeah. and finished my college and all that. So, yeah. Now, did you, did you do boot camp after your junior year? Yeah. So my junior summer. Huh? So I went to Fort Leonard Wood. Like it, you were is, in with all the other older guys kind of thing. They, yes. Yeah, so, so the summer, uh, so we did in the summer, so it's three months of boot camp, And so that summer, it, they call it a summer surge. So there's a whole bunch of young students. And back in that time, the split option program was very popular. And also the delayed entry program was another program that they had that had a lot of young people going in in summer, doing their basic. Huh. Interesting. Did you ever meet a guy named Gary Gilmore? Yeah. Chaplain Gilmore. Yeah. He yeah. was my uh, brigade chaplain when I was uh-huh. in the national guard. And then, uh, when I, when I came back after all my army stuff, uh, so I, I was sent to Iraq in, um, 2004, uh-huh. 2005 time period. When I came back, that's when I applied to be into the, um, chaplain candidate program because I got into seminary. And so, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. I was first going for the army chaplain candidate program, especially in the Missouri army national guard and chaplain Gilmore was the state chaplain at that time. And so the things happened. They lost my application and I was like, ah, forget it. The air force already said that they would take me, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> and chaplain Gilmore called me. He's like, uh, cause he knew me because of our time together at, uh, the, uh, 30, uh, the 20th aviation brigade. <laughs> and so, uh, He's like, uh, at the time I was Sergeant, Sergeant Martinez, I'm really sorry that we lost your packet. Is there any way that we could get you to reconsider? I said, no, sir. I already said that I would accept the, the Air Force's offer to take me in as a chaplain candidate. So, uh, <laughs> but I love Chaplain Gilmore. He was, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, so my ex-wife, uh, grew up with Gary's wife. And Gary, we, we were married at Redbridge Baptist Church, oh, that's where uh-huh. I was married in, in 1982. And uh, my, my wife was roommates with, uh, with, with Gary's sister-in-law oh, wow. at, at Baylor. So I, so I met Gary uh, when I was probably a freshman or sophomore at Baylor because I started dating, you know, Jan, my, my former wife, Janet, and uh, she was roommates with Linda. And I think Gary's wife is Sue, I think. Sue I, Gilmore. Yeah, I'm not sure. And, yeah. And uh, anyway, so I know both of those families because they were both from Redbridge Baptist Church days. My That's the church my wife grew up in. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, yeah, and then Gary went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, which is where my brother-in-law went. So when I would, when when I was dating my wife, we would go see her brother, and they were they were like almost next door to Gary and Sue. So we would see Gary and Sue all the time while Gary was in seminary, and you know, and then we bumped into each other along throughout the years. I was working on a second doctorate at Midwestern, and Gary would pop in there every now and then, and we'd see each other. You know that, yeah, yeah, long history there. But yeah, yeah, small yeah, world. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. So then, how long did you serve in the National Guard, and and did you go? Where did you go to seminary? So, I, so when I came back from Iraq, I started going to St. Paul School of Theology here okay. in Kansas City, it's a United Methodist Seminary. And at the time, um, I was in the independent Christian churches, so which is uh, mm-hmm. along the same historical line as the Christian Churches Disciples of Christ, you know, so 
somewhere in my high school years, I switched from going to a Southern Baptist congregation and started going to a uh, independent Christian church called Parkview Christian Church. And uh, I was really involved with a, a college ministry called the Campus Houses. So it's a it's some of these universities have these campus houses, Christian campus house, um, that are that are affiliated with independent Christian churches and community Christian churches and all this other stuff. So really involved with that. Got involved with church planting after I graduated from college. So I was helping planting churches already right after college. Um, so I graduated college in 2002 and was doing, you know, that kind of thing. And I was happy in my life because I was in the army. I was doing what they call uh, AGR, active, active uh, guard reserve. Uh, so I was a guard member, but I was active duty uh, working with the counter drug program here in the state of Missouri. And so I get called up and go to Iraq and then I come back and I, in Iraq, I get my calling to ministry. And so I come back and I, uh, I applied to minister, uh, to seminary, got involved in seminary and then started applying for the chaplain candidate program. Well, during that time, you can't, you can't be, I can't, I couldn't hold my rank as a E5 sergeant because when you're a chaplain candidate, you get promoted to a uh, second lieutenant. And so I had to get out of my position. I was going to seminary full time. And so I was trying to figure out, okay, what, what is it that I got to do to make sure I don't have a break in service and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. the chaplain candidate program is offered by all the military. So air force army and Navy all have chaplain candidate programs. And so applied to the army. They were like, Oh, we lost your packet. The air force was like, Oh, you have combat experience. Yeah, we want you as a chaplain. <laughs> so I, they took me up real quick. So they paid for my seminary for me to go through seminary, and they would send me on to these um, orientations, basically. So for the summer, I would go to a after my training. My so I had officer training my first summer, and went through uh, what they call chaplain candidate school, and then I got sent off to a base for that summer. So it's like. Uh, training at Maxwell Air Force Base, and then I went to Altus Air Force Base as my first base to go to to get oriented as what a chaplain does, sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. uh, so did that through my whole seminary career. So it was pretty cool. Got to go experience different military installations. They 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 uh, they sent me to CPE Clinical Pastoral Education at Medigan Army Medical Center. So it was a joint. Uh, learning opportunity with the army chaplaincy and the air force chaplaincy and it was just a really cool experience yeah so that's how i got involved in the military chaplaincy and i'm still a military chaplain uh at the 139th airlift wing in st joseph missouri in the air national guard but i'm probably going to retire at the end of december so <laughs> it'll okay. be 26 right. years of total military service wow man well god bless you yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Thanks for your service and all of that. I had a I have a nephew that was injured over in Iraq. Um, mm -hmm. and he the Denver Cirks is his name. But I remember when he first was sent out, um, we went to some town down south of Kansas City and I went, you know, and then they put them all on a on buses and shipped him off. So I went down there to see him off. And actually Gary Gilmore was at that. This was, I don't know, 15 years, 20, I don't know how long ago. Been a yeah. while. Well, Belton, but, uh, Belton, right Missouri after... had... go ahead. Yeah. Belton, Missouri has a big um, army national guard unit there. So it might've been think, Belton. Uh, we might've been in Belton met in a big, huge yeah. big high school auditorium or something. And there were just, mm -hmm. just loads of guys being sent Mm -hmm. off to uh iraq you know yeah yeah golly 20 years ago maybe something yeah, like that 2004 through 2006 um the majority of the fighting force in iraq and afghanistan was the national guard the reserve units you know so yeah we made up 40 percent of the fighting force over there mm. during that time wow wow when I was in seminary at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in the 80s, I took a church planting class with a guy named Daniel Sanchez. Okay. And he, he was with the Home Mission Board 
uh, church planting division, but I was also teaching at seminary. But he's taught all over America. Whoops. Um, to uh, sorry, my phone rang and you went <laughs> off the screen, and I thought I had it on. I had it on. Uh, I don't know why it did that because I had it had it on Do Not Disturb. Oh well. Anyway, um, but yeah, that was and he that was at the time when um, Rick Warren was being featured because Rick had Rick had actually gone to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and then moved to Orange County and planted uh, Saddleback Community Church, and it had already been he did that like in the late seventies. And so by the time I hit like seminary and was already thinking about church planting myself, um, I actually applied with the home mission board after I graduated from seminary to plant a church through the home mission board of the Southern Baptist. But I was a little, I'd kind of gotten involved in sort of the charismatic Baptist world, Mm. which wasn't a huge world, Mm -hmm. but it was both at college and at seminary. I had gone to a Southern Baptist church that was kind of like, I call them charismatic light, L I T E, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we did contemporary worship and all that, but it wasn't like full blown Pentecostal theology. It wasn't full blown Pentecostal experientially either, but it was, but still, you know, contemporary worship, prayed for the sick, did all those kind of stuff. And I applied for the home mission board and they turned me down. I was too charismatic. Hmm. So, uh, and even though I wasn't like theologically a Pentecostal, you know what I mean? So, right. But it was just this kind of traditional, like, yeah, we'll let those churches stay and give us money, but we're not going to try to plant any of them, <laughs> that kind of mentality, you know. So then I, I went on staff at church in Virginia and then moved back to Kansas City in 1990 and started Vineyard Church. And I literally didn't have a core group, didn't have money, didn't have facility, just knocked on doors and raised my own support. Mm-hmm. from like the people that went to my wedding <laughs> and said, yeah. like sent out a, uh, you know, a snail mail newsletter, like, uh, Hey, we're starting a new church. If you want to support us, here's how you can do it. You know? And, uh, it was a tough, it was a tough start, but, uh, tell us about your church planting experience. What drew you to it? Uh, and wh- why are you still passionate about it? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so, as I said before, we, uh, so by the time I was graduated from college, I was married, uh, to my wife that who we were high school sweethearts and we went to college at the same college and we were involved with the Christian, Christian campus houses. And, um, after we graduated, we were just searching for, uh, a home, you know, uh, a church home. And we went to, gosh, I can't even count on both hands on me, uh, congregations that we went to go visit and um the campus minister at at, uh, warnsburg at central uh, university of central missouri he put us in contact with a guy that was here in um independence missouri and he was starting a house church and uh so my wife and i we were talking about it we were thinking about it we were uh met with uh his name was chad we met with chad and we you just felt it on our heart that God was saying, this is where I want you to be. And so we went to go at Ryan's where when Ryan's was open, <laughs> had us a, a buffet meal. Um, mm-hmm. And Chad starts to go in into a spiel. You know, I'm like, listen, man, don't don't worry about it. We're going to we're going to help you. We're going to join. We're going to do it. So we just kind of like felt the call of God to say, hey this is where I want you to be and this is who you're going to help and this is how you're going to do it. So we got involved with the, we called it Mars Hill, unrelated to the Mars Hill in Seattle, unrelated to the Mars Hill in in Michigan with Rob Bell. So uh, we we call ourselves Mars Hill. We were a house church and we just started um, connecting there in independence and we grew into about three houses, you know, so we had a network of three house churches and uh that that was before i got sent off to uh to to war so uh yeah so that's how it started so we were with that group and then when i came back started going to seminary and um at that time the saint paul school theology wasn't really interested in like helping 
to to educate me in more of like these startup you know uh sort of like methodologies uh you know because i studied about the missional church from my time with uh mars hill so i was i was bringing this new language into their into seminary and um their primary focus was more of social justice oriented uh sort of focus on theology and so that's where i started mingling the social uh the social justice aspect to um sort of like this missional church movement church planting methodology stuff and um <clears throat> i really didn't fit in any kind of place there there where i grew up in or where i'm leading into with the uh the mainline protestant christianity so i was kind of like stuck in my own little world <laughs> mm -hmm. trying to develop this theology of like starting new congregations in a way that um that's that speaks to a lot of people you know it's not just the traditional here are the different church planting models that we have you know so I'll, during that time there was a big boom of conversation and methodologies uh, other than missional church, you know, there was like sticky church there or also was the emergent church movement, you know, things of that nature. So just really um, rich and like literature of different types of starting new congregations. So, yeah. And then, so since then, it's just kind of stuck with me. And, and like after I graduated from seminary, um, I was helping other church plants. So Mars Hill closed down in like the midst of my my seminary career because I had to have a contextual learning place and they didn't believe a church plant was contextual enough. <laughs> so I had to go to a traditional pulpit, you know, a traditional congregation. Uh, so I went to this uh, uh, church called Greenwood Christian Church. It was an independent Christian church. And so I, I, I was, stayed there for about a year and a half during my seminary career, uh, helping them uh revitalize so i was using a lot of these church collecting methodologies to revitalize their congregation so i was experimenting there on that and then yeah. af after that um i got involved with a, another church plant called crossroads church um and that church was kind of like um underneath the uh, great commission organization which uh, there's a little bit of an affiliation with the uh southern baptist but they they were primarily a non-denominational church. So, but they were in the heart of the city of Kansas city. So I was like really interested in that because of the aspect of getting to the social justice work, but they called it mercy ministries. So <laughs> there was this whole theology tug there uh, with the planting pastor and myself. Was that, uh, that wasn't Sam Newby, was it? No, Sam Newby did the uh, um, bridge, uh, bridge, Bridgeport. Yeah, Bridgeport. Bridgeport. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but we were close to San Newby, right across the yeah, street. Yeah, who who was the guy that started the crossroads? I forgot. His his, his name is AJ Vanderhorst. Okay. Yeah, AJ right. Vanderhorst, and yeah. uh, he's a he was a graduate of Midwestern uh, uh, Baptist Theological Seminary. Okay. Okay. So, so the whole um, so the North American Mission Board, they were a part of that. Uh, the so we had a lot of dealings with um, different church planting organizations like Forge, um, Brad Briscoe and, and Lance Ford were some of the other big kind of like church planting networking people that we were getting involved with. Uh, so I know this, Lance. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah Brad, Brad Briscoe is a, a, a prominent name within the Southern Baptist churches in the church planting realm. I, I re totally respect the guy. He's got a lot of good knowledge, a lot of good yeah. work out there. So... I know Ed Setzer. Oh yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. He's another. He 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 was another Southern Baptist church planter guy. You know. Well, his work with the uh, missional churches, like yeah, his book is seminal, like to the whole thing. Like it's a foundational uh -huh. piece. Like if if you're into church planting, you need to read Ed Setzer's work <laughs> mm -hmm. as as like a one of the cornerstones. As uh, yeah, 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 for the for the area. Yep. Cool. Well, um, why do you think we need to start churches? So as, as we move <laughs> into disciples theology, so I, when I came into the disciples about, um, 2011 and, um, they're the way that they're, they're structured. So the, the structure of the 
the design of the Christian church, disciples of Christ, is that they're one church, right? And all and, and the expression of this one church is through congregations. So uh, church planting language has always been kind of like uh, foreign <laughs> in the in the world of disciples, even though that we like in the mid 2000s, uh, we had this 2020 vision plan uh, trying to start new congregations. But a lot of people were trying to use the church planting material to kind of do this work. And that's not how we're really designed. So um, we're using new language. So we're starting this language called well, it's movement making. So taking a lot of the key pieces from the uh, advocacy and organizational community organizing groups, you know, utilizing some of that language to kind of build this new terminology of how we start new congregations or church planting. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why we need new congregations is because we have gone through a lot of stuff since 1999. You know, that's where I say that's when my ministry kind of began <laughs> in 1999 um, because uh of we had all this big boom from moving from the church growth uh, movement to this missional church, emergent church kind of uh, talk, and then everything that's happened between that time and today. So we've had a pandemic that's really uh, giving us a, a narrative to figure out how do we to start new faith communities that speak to people in this pandemic informed world. I don't call it post pandemic because we're not post pandemic anything. As you can see, you have somebody sick with COVID still. <laughs> so, yeah, COVID my, still my producer, Matt Cox, a lot of, you know, Matt, um, he is, his whole family's down with COVID right now. So <laughs> Jose and I are at different places in, in my house and Matt's at a different location at, with a mask on, <laughs> yeah. pulling this thing off. Yeah. Yeah. So all that, but, so we, so we have to kind of switch on how we do ministry. So, um, so the old of like build it and they will come sort of thing is not going to be the thing to do anymore. And even in the, the mid two thousands to the later two thousands, we were really experimenting as a whole, like everybody within the Christian Christendom, uh, was experimenting of different ways of how to be, uh, this, this body, this called community, this ecclesia, you know, sort of thing. And so we're just taking lessons out of that and um, really trying to move forward and seeing what the next thing is, the next normal. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm in the disciple of Christ now, for those of my listeners who didn't realize that uh, I, you know, I started off, I'm writing a memoir right now. First part, Southern Baptist Fred, second part, Vineyard Fred, third part, um, prodigal pastor Fred, I guess with, uh, with, and, but I'm in the DOC now and I've, that's only been eight true for eight months. And I'm, you know, I'm taking all the courses and getting my standing, you know, so that they can accept my previous ordination, all that kind of stuff. But I'm curious, theologically, what moved you from the independent Christian church world, which is quite a bit more conservative mm -hmm. than the DOC world, though the DOC world is a mixture, right? There's, right. there's still congregations that are probably fairly conservative, maybe not that different from the independent Christian churches, but then there's others that are, that are more progressive. And I think DOC would be considered one of the historic mainline churches in America. Um, mm -hmm. It's coming out of the, uh, the second great awakening frontier revivals in the 1800s. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that whole theological, journey that I went on <clears throat> was really based after my seminary career. Like as I was, cause I grew up early childhood Southern Baptist churches and like I had this staunch Calvinistic, uh, tulip theology. <laughs> right. And as I was moving forward in my own thinking as a, as a young teen and figuring out where did God fit into my life and how do I live my life as a Christian? Do I even truly believe uh, about God or do I truly believe Jesus saves? You know, that sort of thing on that questioning. Um, my questions weren't being answered well within the church communities that I was with, with the Southern Baptist churches. And so as I moved from that and tried different churches, the independent Christian church, there seemed to be a more of, a, of an openness of some sort of conversation. 
But the key thing that really drew me to the, the Christian churches, uh, independent Christian churches, was the communion. So in in the Southern Baptist churches, you know, it's usually communion once a quarter, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but in the, in the independent Christian churches and the Christian churches, Disciples of Christ, it's every time as you gather. So every Sunday. So with that piece of bread and that little juice cup, that was like a tangible, a tangible interaction that I could have with God mm. that moment in time for me. Mm. So it made God real for me at that time. And, you know, I can see why there's all this conversation in the uh, Catholic uh, conversation with Lutherans about co-substantiation, transubstantiation, you know, things of that nature. I mean, because it, it was really real for me. God was real in that moment. It, like, even though these elements didn't have God in it, you know, this interaction connected me with Jesus, you know. So uh, that was one of the main reasons why <laughs> I, I went to the independent Christian churches. And and yes, their theology is pretty, pretty uh, conservative, Mm-hmm. So as I was going through my seminary career and like looking at the social justice aspect of it, I reconnected with my Latino roots. Um, my grandmother, uh, she marched with Cesar Chavez and she was in those civil rights movements in in California in the seventies and, you know, working, uh, you know, working for uh, rights of the immigrant farm workers and things of that nature. So I got to like go back into that history and, see why my grandmother was doing what she was doing. And it was all based from her faith as a Catholic, (laughs) you know? So it was really interesting. So I kind of like got into this. And when I was speaking that language in the, to the audience of the independent Christian churches, it wasn't being received really well. So I felt out of place and I felt like, well, is there a home for me? And so uh, as I was looking for places and talking with people, uh, encountered the regional minister of the greater Kansas city region at that time was, uh, Paul deal. And he said, you sound like, uh, a disciple because, uh, at the church I was at Greenwood Christian church, they used to be disciples or they, yeah. So they used to be connected with the disciples because back in the sixties and seventies and at that time frame, uh, there was a schism sort of thing. And so half of the people went independent Christian churches. The other half went, uh, disciples of Christ. I think it was in the fifties. So the, so there were some of these land disputes, but the Greenwood Christian church were still being listed in the yearbook and they didn't want to be listed in the yearbook anymore. So I was having, having that process with Paul at the time of like, how do we get them off the yearbook? And, you know, cause they're independent Christian churches, you know, that sort of thing. And so through those conversations with Paul, he's like, you sound like more disciple than, than independent Christian churches. So I was like, okay, well, let's see how this goes. And so I kept in relationship with him. And then um, I got a a call to be um, the pastor at First Christian Church in downtown Kansas City. And that's when I took the jump to be, you know, changing my ordination to the disciples and everything else like that. So where was that at? What what part of Kansas City? Uh, It was in downtown Kansas City, uh, First Christian Church. So it, it used to be, so it closed down. So it used to be on 10th and Forest, right next to city union mission and oh, yeah. city union mission b- ended up buying the building because it was a, a square building and had three floors and uh they renovated it and now it's like a uh some sort of office where they help people transition sort of thing so it's really cool that the ministry okay. is still going on there okay cool so so your 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 family roots with like social, with justice work as it related to first generation immigrants to the United States mm-hmm. that, that your grandmother was in. Yes. That yeah. sparked in you um, a theological renaissance of sorts that um, led you to move from the, the independent Christian, Christian church to the disciples. It was just a better fit right. as far as theological fit goes. Right. Mm-hmm, right. All right. It's kind of interesting because DOC isn't creedal. Right. But it's got core values and, and has an ethos and a, and a sense of community and, 
and and where the churches are going. Where why? How do you see like you know um, America's? You know, I have I I have hope for America, but kind of a mess right now, don't you think? Right. I mean, we so are many mess. messy things politically, yeah. but I, and I I do think that politics crowds you know so much stuff uh it it it's really been a divisive thing you know i mean perhaps it always has been to some degree but i don't think to the to the degree that it is now um and uh if you think about starting churches now i mean like you know it, it was interesting in the in the 60s and 70s and 80s in 90s and even 2000s when the mainline churches in America were declining 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 there were still these conservative evangelical churches that were there were there there were still some life there's still a lot of growth mm-hmm. i mean like even my church even though it was kind of like a charismatic light somewhat i mean we had female pastors and you know, welcoming to everybody kind of a thing, but, um, but still, you know, probably on the more conservative, I don't know, I would have considered myself like a progressive evangelical at some point. My professors at Midwestern called me a British evangelical, <laughs> which that I think that that was just a nice way of saying you're, you're, a, you're a liberal evangelical, you know, cause mm-hmm. you know, I had women pastors and you know, a lot of differences that, right. that we had culturally, but now in the last 15 years even even those churches a lot of time i mean there's still growing churches out there all over the place but as a whole i'm speaking broadly now across american lines even the conservative churches who prided themselves on these these tenants are are leaking you know they're losing you know i don't the estimates are you know a few million people every year are leaving churches still like year after right. year after year after year you know this this de-churching of america has been going on for 50 years or more right mm-hmm. so how you know but and then when you listen to people out there who are leaving the churches or you listen to people who've never been in churches how is it how can these how can starting new congregations with the doc ethos uh how, how, how does that work how what's your vision what would you like to see happen? Yeah. Why, so why do you, why do you want to help? Why do you want to give your life to this? You know? Yeah. Well, cause, cause I do love our communities, you know, um, I do also have hope for the United States, you know, and serving in the military for so long that I do believe we're a great, we're a good country and we got a lot of good people that live here. And, um, Hey Matt, just hold on a second. Um, okay. I see it says release video order. Like Jose just started freezing up on me quite a bit, Matt. You see that? It's it's good on my end. Is it? Huh. My, my a, a little sign when he started freezing up, a little sign just popped. It says release video order. Do you know what that means? No, I think that's just with the the order that you have the tiles arranged in on your screen. Oh, okay. All right. Well, anyway, yeah, I think you're unfrozen now though. Sorry. Sorry about that, everybody. But Jose started freezing up on me a little bit. All right. All right. Roll. So one of the, one of the ethos things that I think that, um, because I want to help our nation as a whole. And I think the church plays a big part of that. I mean, any church, you know, whether you're Southern Baptist to, to, to disciples of Christ that, we we need to come together yeah and that was like one of the founding principles uh within the restoration movement which our denomination flows from is this idea of christian unity um being able to sit at the table and have a conversation even though that we have all these uh these diversities which is fine to have diversity right uh but there is this there's this idea of like we can still come together as as a community uh, in love. And I think with, uh, the disciples, that's what I'm trying to push as the undergirding thing, just getting back to our basics of Jesus is the reason, (laughs) you know, no creed, but Christ. 
um, and, and all things love, you know, and just getting back to that and really helping the stratification that our political environment environment has done to our society and just bringing people back to the table, coming back to Jesus's table and just having those conversations. That's, that's like the basic gist of all that I do when I'm, you know, giving, um, we have this thing called leadership Academy and giving these approaches to how to start new faith communities. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a vineyard church. It's not going to be these big mega churches, you know, sort of thing. It just might be, you know, 12 people around a table talking about Jesus and, you know, loving on one another and having community and going out there and doing good for the common good, you know? So, uh, yeah, that's the basics for me. Okay. It seems to me that, uh, in, in the culture today, it, it's almost like when I listen to some people talk about Jesus and other people talk about Jesus, almost seems like there's more than one Jesus out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's gun toting Jesus who is kind of militant Jesus and wants, you know, wants to establish, you know, Christian nationalism in America. And then there's the Jesus I'm familiar with, <laughs> who's a pacifist, who tells us to love our enemies and uh, lay our lives down and take up the cross. And, you know, and it's about love God, love your neighbor, even love your enemy. Mm. And in my mind, the more people that would follow that Jesus, the better off we'd be. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? You understand think what I'm saying? I know you yeah, do. Yeah, know you do. I'm just yeah. <laughs> there, for me, there's like space for conversation of all those Jesuses. You know, there's the Jesus that flips the tables in the temple. There's the Jesus that curses the tree, you know, that a lot of people, you know, can affiliate. Hey, that's Jesus saying, hey, get your gun. You know, sort of thing. Um, and, and, you know, uh, faith is an experiential thing. So being... Um, able to be open to it, uh, it, I think is one of the key things, but we're shutting ourselves out. We're, 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 we're taking our own little piece of the kingdom and, and covenant it by ourselves, you know, and just holding it on and everybody's outside, you know, even, even, no matter what part of the spectrum you're, you're on, I see this on both the, the liberal side and also the, the very conservative side. So, uh, so if we can break down those walls and really be what, what we were called to be, as a called community, you know, getting back to that, that, that word in Greek, you know, the called assembly uh, and allowing the spirit to work. You know, I, I think of Pentecost, you know, it's like of all the diversity that was happening during the day of Pentecost and, and people were still able to understand each other because of the spirit. If we can just like positions ourselves, like posture ourselves in that way, where allow the spirit to work in that manner. Uh, we're always going to have differences of opinion. Well, like which Jesus is the true Jesus, you know, and we won't really know until the trumpet sound <laughs> and all this other stuff, you know, right? So I think I think though, like if we if we emphasize love God, love your neighbor, mm -hmm. and as hard as it is, even love your enemy, which is always challenging and always includes a lot of forgiveness and a lot of healing and a lot of emotional healing from trauma potentially and all that kind of stuff. Right. And we emphasize the table, like that's one of the things I've loved about the DOC is the emphasis on the table. Like you mentioned, every service ends with communion, but if, but the theology of that table is rich because Jesus practiced table fellowship differently than most of his fellow Jewish leaders. Mm -hmm. Can explain that to us a little bit. If we practice that table practice of Jesus where would that take us? Yeah, so everybody's welcome to the table, as like I always say, because it's not our table. It's Jesus's table. So it's like it, it, we, there's no possession in it other than it belongs to God. And, and to me, like that's, that's the whole premise of life. You know, our life is not our own. It's, it belongs to God. You know, and what, we have the autonomy to decide what we can do with that life. But the, and where 
where holiness comes into play, where, where true uh, miracles happen is when we open ourselves up uh, as the table, you know, inviting people in no matter what their perspective is, you know, and there are people that are going to be against you at the table. So Jesus sat with Judas and Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him, you know, having that kind of mentality uh, towards life and inviting people uh, into discussion, into uh, this life, this goodness that, that God has given us, uh, I think is key in the whole thing. And that, that was completely different from what Jesus was doing, but from the, the, you know, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees on there, you know, they selected the right people. Cause you know, the t- when Jesus invited, you know, Zacchaeus and all those others, uh, the uh, Mary Magdalene and all of them to the table, he was being criticized, you know, because you were inviting those people in, you know? Right. So, yeah, I think we need to all take a note from that. <laughs> and that's why I like the disciples so much. I love the disciples so much because of that mentality, even though sometimes we don't practice it very well <laughs> ourselves, <laughs> but that's the, that's the, that's the key. The, uh, the, the archetype is following Jesus mm-hmm. way in that table. So. Yeah. 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 So let's just take like a young seminary student who feels a call to get involved in church, starting a new congregation. What, what kind, what, what kind of process do they go through? Uh, when it comes to the disciples, um, first off, reach out to your regional minister <laughs> um, because we are a covenantal church. Uh, so the regions and the regional ministers were in covenant with the not only the local churches, but also to the general church. So there's no like hierarchy in the sense of, you know, the general church says this and it's going to happen that way. Yeah, that's not the way it works. The responsibility of starting new congregations in an area it belongs to the region. So the regional minister is there to help um, facilitate and, and help guide um, the regional members to start these new congregations, to care for those congregations, to care for the chartered members that are even there too. So uh, if a person's interested in starting a new congregation in particular area, find your regional minister, have a conversation with the regional minister, and more than likely what they're going to do is going to connect you with the new church commission of that region. So they'll um, they'll introduce you to more people. And so, and they'll tell you like, what are the other requirements? So a lot of our uh, people that are starting new congregations we call them movement initiators. Uh, sometimes they might have a, a theological background and, and a degree, sometimes not. And that's okay because there are different pathways to getting your standing, whether it's ordination or commissioning. So uh, they'll tell you through that, that process. But making those relationships is probably the biggest key thing on that, other than developing relationships in your own community, developing that core team, you know, things of that nature, start gathering together, meeting together and living life together. Mm, mm. Um, so they would like, if you're in the Kansas city region mm-hmm. or any, how many regions are there in America in Canada? There, there's 31. Okay. And if, if you contact any of those regional ministers, wherever people are at, then eventually they're going to probably intersect with you. Is that right? In yes. some way or another? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because so, you oversee all of those 31 regions, right? Or at least you're involved or partnered with those 31 regions. Right, creating relationships to see like, uh, so New Church Strategies is about like helping regions think about different strategies of starting new congregations in those areas, depending on whether it's a rural area, whether it's a suburban area or urban area. So they, you often call, call me to say, hey, Jose, what is this area? How, what's the um, feasibility of starting something new? Uh, here's this person, he has this, or she, he or she has this idea uh, that they want to start this new community. And it's like, okay, well, let's have a conversation. And so sometimes I even fly out there um, so I can sit in the environment. Because to me, like if you, you can read everything on paper, but you really don't get a sense of community until you're, enveloped by them <laughs> so so i usually go out there and just um uh meet people meet with the with the person that's going to start the new community 
meet with the regional minister, meet with uh, the new commission team. So it's a, it's a pretty long process in the whole thing, but mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, that's how it goes. And so they encounter me and then we got this um, program. It's called leadership Academy is a, a service that we provide for the church and ministry for the church. And there's different tiers. So they'll come in with the first track, which is called emerge and go through some material things to think about as they're starting their new uh, faith community. And then we get them aligned with a coach. So I have a, an associate minister, Dr. Reverend Dr. Joy Robinson. She is the person that lines them up with a coach. So we have, uh, and that's a free service. They don't have to pay for the coach. We pay for the coach. They get coaching throughout the time as they're going forward in this new church commission, uh, this uh, new church development. Okay. Okay, cool. So what are you, what are you most excited? Where do you see the most fresh new life in these 31 regions? What are you, what are you most excited about when it comes to these new congregations? They look completely different from what we've seen in the past. So a lot of times we use these metrics, uh, budgets, butts, and buildings, <laughs> right? Yeah, I know um, those. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, and, and they're, they're decent metrics. If you're counting, if you're measuring your success with uh, quantity, mm -hmm. um, I mean, they kind of work, uh, but we're looking for the quality aspect of things. And so the metrics are shifting. So um, new congregations might not have a building, you know, they might uh, be meeting uh, during a bike ride and that like, through the bike riding, like there's a bike church sort of thing or skate church. Uh, there is this one uh, uh, ministry that I saw that they um, they got a old rundown former church and they put skate ramps in them, <laughs> you know, and they're and they're serving the community. The the teens come. This is like they have an after school program. Um, they encounter these teens that are out there on the streets. They're providing these different social services to them all the while doing this in the name of God, you know, it's because Jesus is, is their inspiration to move forward into this and their, and their, and their community and they gather together and they, and they're involved with each other's lives and they know things about them. And they're creating these spiritual rhythms of praying and uh, blessing one another and celebrating with one another. And, you know, of course with the skateboarding, it's recreational, you know, and, but they're causing transformative uh, impact on these young people's lives for mm. the good, for the better, you know? So that's what yeah. I'm excited about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like every niche that's out there, you can kind of probably create some kind of community around it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you could do you could do an anime. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who are, uh, who aren't supporting yet, and if you, you, you you're about, we're, we're about out of time, but if you've made it to the end of this uh, interview, thanks so much. Jump over to spiritualityadventures.com and, and jump on our uh, support team. And then we provide bonus content for all of our uh, supporters. And we had a fun conversation about some of, about some of Jose's interests. And by the way, too, um, yeah, I was riding my bicycle just, what, a few days ago. <laughs> and uh, I, I come up on this this Mexican guy riding some kind of vehicle I didn't even recognize. What was that thing? Anyway, I pa I passed by. I recognized you from the back. I said, "Hey, man, get off the road." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're on a bike trail out near Parkville. Yeah, it's a, it was called it's called a half bike. I bought I bought a half bike. Um, so I injured I injured my knee in jujitsu doing a throw on. A person I shouldn't have been throwing and tore up my knee. So um, the exercise that I've been getting since I can't run is this half bike thing. So it puts it's like an elliptical almost, but it's you stand up and you're pedaling and you move forward and it's relatively good. I love it. I I've never ridden one of those. I think I might. I I crash on my bike still. So you know if I'm if I'm doing technical mountain biking, so uh, I'd probably figure out a way to crash on that thing. It looked like you needed a little <laughs> balance on that sucker. Yeah, it's like uh, a mixture of skiing, like uh, downhill skiing, and, and then um, biking, and 
they said something else too because you have to use your weight to kind of like steer because <laughs> the the handlebar doesn't turn so so we could start a we could start a two-wheeled niche uh <laughs> yeah community around uh two-wheelers mm -hmm. something like yeah. that non non-motorized two-wheelers <laughs> yeah these electric bikes are getting to where they're almost like motors now oh yeah these, it's, these uh these batteries are yeah yeah e-bikes they're yeah, they're they're the rage now. I'm still pedaling. I I still want to get some exercise and burn some calories and stuff. You know, you can do it with an e-bike too. But right, right. Yeah. Well, cool, Jose. It's great to talk with you. I'm so thankful that our paths crossed and uh, that we're going to be able to uh, serve together in the future. So I'm excited about that. Um, for those who are who are listening, if you know somebody that's a young person who might be or any age person for that matter, um, that might be interested in, uh, new congregations and, you know, being a part of some, some of the stuff that we've talked about here, I'd really encourage you to contact Jose and, uh, and, or put them in touch, you know, just shoot them a link, share this, this interview, and then, Hey, Hey, listen to this and see if you're interested. And then if, if, if some of you are listening and you're interested uh, get a hold of Jose. How did the people get a hold of you, Jose? Yeah. So uh, my email address is jmartinez at newchurchministry.org. Our website's newchurchministry.org, and you can contact us through there. We are on all social media platforms. Uh, well, Instagram, Facebook, um, X <laughs> at New Church Ministry. Uh, so you can find us on there. And we, we do a lot of posting, especially on Instagram. So if you can like and follow us, on Instagram, that'd be great. We're on YouTube also. Um, we do all kinds of things. So you can find us on any any uh, social media platform. Excellent. Excellent. And what's your what's your personal uh, Instagram? An emerging chap. So A-N-E-M-E-R-G-I-N-G-C-H-A-P. Uh, that's my my Instagram. Uh, I'm the only one on there <laughs> that's, that has an emerging chap. Uh, okay. and I made that. I made that when I made my uh, my email address uh, with the same name back in the day when uh, the emerging church and the emergent church conversation was happening. You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, hey, I'm going to be at. Uh, I have never met Trip Fuller personally. Oh I've yeah. Been in, we we've traded emails a couple of times. I'm going to be at this theology beer camp in Springfield on October 19, 2021. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of an interesting, uh, new crowd of people that I've been hanging out with a little bit, this, um, uh, uh, process theology crowd, you know? Oh yeah. Kind of interesting yeah. stuff. I, I, yeah. Trip Fuller is awesome. He's just so smart. And, um, I knew him back when he was, uh, he was doing this thing called the hatchery that we had in, in our denomination out in the Pacific Southwest region just really intelligent. And, um, but he, he brings things down to where anybody can understand this theology. So he has this thing called the uh, theology for normal people. So check that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah a lot I've, of good never, stuff. I've never, I don't think I've ever heard somebody who can make nerdy theology as much fun as trip. Probably. I mean, <laughs> seriously like that. I've had a lot of professors through my, educational career and he's I, i'm like man i would have loved this dude if i'd have had him as a professor you know <laughs> oh yeah 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 he's really fun yeah. pretty cool all right man well thank you so much for uh connecting with us on yeah, spirituality adventures I really like it it's a lot of fun excellent thanks everybody for tuning in and uh see you next time Hey, you made it to the end. Thanks for listening all the way through on this episode. By the way, if you're not already a supporter, go to spiritualityadventures.com, sign up for one of our monthly supports, and you will receive our bonus content. You'll receive lots of interesting information about our guests. Many of our musicians will do special bonus songs and record a song. So I want to encourage you to do that. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Be sure and subscribe. Be sure and share any of the episodes that you like. And be sure and make comments if you like them as well. This helps us 
uh, get spirituality adventures out there to more listeners, more, more watchers. So whatever platform you're using, subscribe, like, share, make comments, and go to our website, sign up for our team and be a part of the team support. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time.